Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. First, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before you for oral argument. You're welcome. It's, uh, it's always an honor to be before a panel of this court. It's been 15 years, uh, Judge Morris, since we've appeared together. I'm David Brizzo. I'm the appellate pro se, defendant below. This appeal appears to be from a case, an appeal of first impression, in that the, in the first trial, which this court saw two appeals on, the second one sent a mandate, this court sent a mandate to dismiss it. Trial judge, of course, entered an order of dismissal and specifically said with prejudice. Now, if this weren't a mortgage foreclosure case, that would have been the end of it. You know, when the rule says, unless the order says otherwise, that an order of dismissal operates as an adjudication on the merits. So you know, you know, we're looking square in the face of two Supreme Court decisions that tell us it's okay to do this. I am aware, and I will address those, okay. Your Honor. I keep looking at the rules to see if they've said, except in foreclosure cases. <laughs> so I think the court can appreciate the position that mortgagors find themselves in and as a separate class of persons. And I presume each of you are aware that I gave the court notice, I gave a copy of the notice that I gave to the Supreme Court regarding the constitutional issues. Well, I mean, we're, the Supreme Court was dealing with public policy in terms of an ongoing installment type contract, because if it wasn't treated that way, then borrowers would not have an incentive to continue to make the payments. I'm just simply telling you what our Supreme Court has considered. Um, now, there's some contrary views, but they're in the forms of dissents, which we can't rely on a dissent. I know that you cited Judge Scales, a very good judge down at 3rd DCA who has some issues with this in terms specifically of if there is a final judgment, which was in your favor because we reversed it. Um, if it didn't deny acceleration or otherwise terminate acceleration, um, then the note goes back and is, is active and continues to be a mortgage and installment type contract. There's a continuing obligation to pay. But if the judgment had terminated acceleration and there wasn't any other ability by the bank to accelerate again, then it might be over. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. But see, that's not the Supreme Court's dis the position. <laughs> so help us out. Well, I absolutely agree with you that what the Supreme Court did in Singleton and Bartram was make a policy decision. Yeah, they really didn't touch on the issue about accelerating because when there is a demand, I think your opponent would agree, where there is a demand, a default, and then an acceleration, most mortgage contracts, 99% of them, when they, they when accelerate, when they choose to accelerate, all amounts become due. That is correct. They really didn't address that. In the progeny have Address well, it. and that gets us to the first district's decision that is cited in the trial court's order, the Ferrero and Green Tree case. And what that court was as close, I think that case was as close factually to this and of all of them because the alleged default date was the same as it was here. And I'm quoting from the opinion, the actual defaults upon which previous foreclosure actions were based did not include the additional defaults for the subsequent months at issue in this third action, even though the same language was used in each complaint to describe it. And the court also says, and you all didn't brief this, I don't think, the note was accelerated anew based on the failure of the Ferrero's secure default. 
Therefore, effectively, the court concludes this was not barred as res judicata because the open ended series of defaults included different mispayments at issue in each suit. And that's really, I think, mean, if the trial judge recognized that and that's part of what was the basis of her ruling, I'm struggling to find a reversible error. I beg your pardon, the last thing you said? I'm struggling to find a reversible error. The, the trial court judge was bound by Pereira. We're not, but she was. Or he, whoever it was. She. And, and, and I don't think she had any other choice then, but she and ran foreclosure. If I may address the comments of, of um, at least two of the justices here, which I was going to. You can just call us judges, the justices are on the Supreme Court. I would appreciate that. I, we better than to her the other way. Yeah, we get the pay rate. We get the pay rate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I said it, but I'd like, no, to, I'd like to reserve four minutes. Okay. Or as the British do. <laughs> um, I was going to end with this, but I think I'll address it now. Since Judge Sleep talked about the court making a policy decision. <laughs> and talked about rendering little incentive, the Supreme Court has said, for, for the mortgagors who uh, won at trial to not make any further mortgage payments. And then there's the language we all learned in law school, merely, <laughs> that's such a scary word when you see it in a print, merely because the bank couldn't prove their case at trial. I thought that's what trials were about. Let me, as I said, I was going to end with this. Um, the judge in this second trial entered an order prior to where she did some research and goes through the case law and says, quotes the, uh, one or more cases of this court, and she said that it essentially renders a dismissal with prejudice meaningless, giving lenders, lenders little incentive to comply with the law or court orders. Nevertheless, because the doctrine of res judicata does not bar prosecution when lenders allege subsequent missed payments in a foreclosure, which my comment here by footnote is that you can't tell that on the face of the complaint. Lenders get a second bite at the apple, even after a prior dismissal with prejudice. Thus, with reluctance, the court finds that the doctrine of res judicata does not bar prosecution of this suit. She recognizes the injustice. I would ask the court to do the same. Well, I, before we spend too much time on this, you know, just because there's a Supreme Court decision that controls us doesn't mean we necessarily have to like it. But nevertheless, it does control. So uh, you've, even in your reply brief, kind of acknowledged we're stuck with this. So wouldn't it be better to talk about the other issues that we really might be able to do something about? Because we really can't do anything about this. Well, I understand now completely. I'm trying to help you. Yes, I understand. Thank you, Your Honor. Justice, Morris. <laughs> but justice, Amy Coney Barrett said, Justice Scalia's judicial philosophy is mine. A judge must apply the law as written. Judges are not policy makers, Judge Lee, and they must be resolute in setting aside any policy views they might hold. She further said his judicial philosophy was straightforward. A judge must apply the law as written, not as the judge wishes it were. Sometimes that meant reaching results that he did not like. But as he put it in one of his best known opinions, that is what it means to say we have a government of laws, not of men. Now, Let's talk I about think the Bank of New York Mellon. What do you think? I, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> I, I think you've probably got something to talk about there because I do. you have pointed out that there is a party that is the beneficiary of a judgment foreclosure and the name party does not exist. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and you were on that panel, as I recall, um, where Judge Watley, uh, rest, rest his soul, um, said, but if Bank of New York, if it's not a legal entity, then their standing here is a nullity, a legal entity. You don't have to raise General Motors is not a legal entity. It's General Motors Corporation. If Bank of New York is not a legal entity, then that part, then the party that's gotten the judgment doesn't exist. Now, what I find particularly as we stand here today, I don't know what do I, I'm incredulous. I've raised that the entity doesn't exist in my first case, trial case, in the first appeal, in the second appeal, in this trial case, and... And we know for sure there's no fictitious name registration that's been filed. I have... I know for sure, and I have submitted a... I've got, I can get you the appendix number. I, a statement from the Secretary of State Division of Corporation that there is no Bank of New York Mellon registered with the state of New York, and I've asked the court to take judicial notice of that or accept it as it is. The, the argument is it's registered in Delaware, first of all. Yeah. But operating under the, organized under the rules of New York, that's what they say. But then that a simple amendment to the complaint to fix that? Well, it would be if this hadn't been going on for 15 years. You'd think they would have kind of gotten the clue. I asked them in interrogatories, is the real trustee the Bank of New York Mellon Corporation? The name trustee, and I'm paraphrasing, this is in the record, in the, their answers and objections to interrogatories. The, the name trustee is the Bank of New York Mellon. And I said, is it a fictitious name? Objection. Irrelevant. I think it's real relevant. They said, oh, well, it could be, the Scrivener's error can be fixed even after judgment. This is not a Scrivener's error. They have filed multiple law case, lawsuits, made multiple foreclosures, gotten judgments to an entity that they don't exist. And interestingly enough, the testimony of the bank's representative, excuse me, the services representative, Gina Fieser, said that she uploads payments that they do for other uh, loans within, within the, uh, th this particular group. She has no idea who else, whose name is on that account and who has access to it. It's like, I've been telling them. I, t I kept asking, is it the Bank of New York Mellon Corporation? Objection, it's not relevant. That's, that's not a Scrivener's error. When you tell them, hey, this is what it should be, which is what I was doing. And I also found that, well, let's just say the irony wasn't lost on me, that counsel, who was not trial counsel, um, cites a Form 10-K filed by the Bank of New York Mellon, except it's the Bank of New York Mellon Corporation, if the court bothered to look that up, um, or its clerks. So I think that this case can and should be reversed on matters not precluded by Bartram or Singleton and its progeny. Um, talking about two bites of the apple, which this court has used that expression several times. I did a little Google Scholar, right? that's the only thing I have uh, available to me. In Florida, there are 300 cases that discuss a second bite at or of the apple. Nationwide, state and federal, there are almost 13,000, I think it's 12,800. Why? Because of the, the goal of the courts, what they want is finality. 
not to allow a second bite at the apple. They want finality. And what this means is that under Singleton and Bartram, that the bank can screw up, come back again. Screw up, come back again. You're screw your, up. You're at your 15 minutes, I'm sorry. You're at your 15 minutes. You can use it any way you want. But you're at 15 minutes. Okay, five. I'll take another minute and then I'll All right. save the rest for That'll be fun. Um, the mortgage loan schedule, there's my, my name, not my loan number on it. And it doesn't say what trust it is. I think it proves nothing. Um, the keep on four minutes. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court. Uh, James Wyman of Hinchel and Kobachin on behalf of the Apple uh, uh, the Bank of New York Mellon. Can we talk about uh, um, uh, Bartram and Singleton last? We could not talk about it at all if you want to <laughs> because that, there's nothing we can do about it. So you, what, your hands are tied. I'm, you know, I'm not going to fault the court or applaud it for a decision. It is what it is. As you heard, we said the same thing. So can I go to the other issue? You, what about just leaving the um, the entity identifier out of the name of right. Bank of New York Mellon. Is that a problem? Hey, no, because I mean I refer to it as a scrivener's error in a burden, even if they've said no, that's what we meant. But the, I think the key thing in here is you have to look at you guys have been making it. I mean, his form is well made, you've been making it for decades. Dick, and you you look at the case law, there are I looked last night, just to double check, there are hundreds of district court of appeal cases in Florida with the Bank of New York Mellon, formerly known as the Bank of New York, none of the court, none of that stuff. I think this can be clear very easily. It sounds like you've got a ton of defective judgments out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a can of worms I'm not about to open. Um, but it, in all honesty, the, the, you look at the allonge attached to the, uh, the note, it is paid by J.P. Morgan. The problem with the previous case was that it was paid, it was, uh, it was payable to J.P. Morgan Chase in here, but the Bank of New York Mellon comes in and says, oh, where are the, you know, you know, they couldn't prove the, the chain on the allonges there. Here we now have an allonge that says pay, from J.P. Morgan Chase, payable to the Bank of New York Mellon, formerly known as the Bank of New York. No corporation, no company incorporated after formerly known as the Bank of New York. So what would happen if the bank here had brought the case, the Bank of New York Mellon Corp, formerly known as the Bank of New York Company Incorporated? Oh, that's not what's on the allonge here. I mean, it, you know, Judge Morris. But if you file a fictitious name registration, none of this matters. And apparently, you have not come forward with one. He has looked and hasn't been able to find one. I mean, this is a major corporate screw up for a major bank. And, and you, what you said is correct. And there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, judgments here that have been entered, uh, I'm not going to say fraudulently, but, you know, uh, inappropriately. Um, but I don't think that's the case here because I think, I mean, what do you, what do you, I mean, it's the, in, the endorser here for JP Morgan, to, for whatever reason, put this, you know, put that on there. I mean, I don't know the specifics that go into that uh, the endorsement on a lot, but it says what it says, which is the Bank of New York Mellon. So you can't come in later and say, well, that's, we're really known. You know, that's our fictitious name. Maybe it's not a fictitious name. For whatever you, you have to sue in that capacity. I guess I'm less concerned about the allonge than I am about the name of the case and the bringing the cause of action. You know, I, I, you know well, allonges many times have imperfect, you know, uh, descriptions. Sure. I, I'm well, not bothered by that as much, but I am bothered by the fact that the plaintiff doesn't exist. Well, the plaintiff does exist. It just doesn't have corp attached to its... Um, but why is it? You guys got to fix that. Well, that's something that can be. If it's you know, are you, is the court going to remand? Is going to reverse on that basis and remand? What's the, what's the remedy? Then we go through this all over again. I mean, this is you know, I, I we we, we, we do the, you know, I'm sure we're because, in the business of boot jumping here. That's what we do. Boot yeah. jumping for us. You know, if you don't get it right, you got to go back and get it yeah. right. Yeah, no, Your Honor, I I, I, I will understand that. But, but in certain cases. Um, Judge Gross had an opinion recently. Uh, I mean, you, you, 
if you were a man on this, and I'm not, I'm not going to characterize this as a technicality because I'm just really insulting to the point you're trying to make here. Um, but to remain on that basis, let's do this. Do we do it all? Do all over again? Have to do this again on subsequent defaults and you know, third? You know, this you can just go back and amend the judgment. Well, there we go. I mean, that's that's the I thing. Don't know if you can say how to do it, just tell me it's a problem. I, I think if it's a problem, then that's that's the, you know if the court finds a problem, that's what should be done. You know, there should be an amendment. No one's given us a reason for it not to be a problem. Other than that's just the way we've always done it. I, I'm, I'm not say, I, I'm just saying in this particular instance and. Notwithstanding the, the the hundreds of cases out there, but as a matter of corporate law, there are certain ways you have to do things. And if you're going to operate by a name that's less than your perfect legal name, you've got to file a petition anyway. I mean, that's kind of corporate law 101. I, Your Honor, I would not disagree, but all and I'm, you're asking me to second guess uh, for the trial for Colorado Council, which I've been doing for 15 years, much to my chagrin um, here. But um, I, you know. The, the, the Alange says what it says. So that's, the, I think, and the reason is there are interrogatories and so forth, they say, no, we meant the Bank of New York uh, Mellon. That's what, that's what we meant. And all I can think of is that's, that's what it says in the Alange. The, uh, banks, lenders have been, have a mass pulled out from them so many times on the basis of, of, like, in this case, problems with the Alange, problems with, and so they're being perhaps overly cautious um, in, in this. And so that's all I can, I, I'm just, my supposition here, but I don't think it's a, uh, uh, an ill-advised one here because that's, I mean, I would know, probably do the same in the same circumstances. Otherwise, what do you do? Then you have to go back and get another launch that says to the Bank of, you know, the Bank of New York. Mellon. Of course, you talk about the service, whether it did or didn't have authority to act for the bank and whether that matters. Well, yeah, I mean, it, 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 as we mentioned in the brief, that, that would matter. If Aquin or PHH Mortgage were the party that brought this action, it's not. It's just a loan servicer. I mean, the, the, you know, it had authority to bring in. Mean, if you need, do I need authority here to argue before the court? Do I need to show to you that uh, the Bank of New York Mellon has, has has authorized me to to, to prosecute or defend this appeal? I know. And if it, particularly as far you know, it's like the the the, the power of attorney is to establish the nexus between. The bank here and the loan servicer. So when the loan servicer's witness, fees are here, gets up and testify, yeah, there's a nexus established there. Um, so uh, that's all that's all about. And it's you know and that I you know in, in this particular case, uh, plaintiffs counsel counsel for the bank dotted a lot of eyes and, and crossed a lot of teeth in it forward necessary as, as a precautionary measure the PSA, interesting all that stuff. That's none of that stuff was actually necessary here because you know as the court well knows to, to establish entitlement to foreclosure, you need the note, the mortgage, evidence of uh, of an amount due, and uh, the notice of default. And then you establish standing. All that stuff. Those things were all taken care of. But now we have these, I'm not going to call them tangential issues, but why not? Let's call them tangential issues here. And the PSA is one of them. So is the power of attorney. I mean, these, these have no bearing on standing or whether the bank is entitled to foreclose. Uh, I, I, those things are all part and parcel of the same type of argument here. That guy, I know he, he, Mr. Perizzo doesn't come out and say, oh, it is, you know, this, is, this you know, couldn't establish standing on the basis of these problems with the PSA. But it taxes it nonetheless, and I'm I'm trying to think what's the goal here is to say well there's no standing. I mean that's what people what, what borrowers have normally done, or a bank or a lender has relied on loan servicer relied on the PSA to establish standing. You know then yeah we can attack you know not necessarily compliance with the PSA, but whatever it is in the PSA that supposedly establishes standing for the for the bank or the lender here. But that's not the case here. Because standing was established independently out of the the, the, the fact uh, or. or I'm calling it the FOC presumption. We all always call it the RTS presumption based on the fourth DCA's case. But that, you know, if you, if you, uh, if, the, if the copy of the, uh, if the original note, the note, note and mortgage, you know, the file uh, with the court is identical to the copy that was filed with the complaint, you've established a presumption, uh, a rebuttal presumption standing, but you've established standing. There was nothing to rebut that. So reduced to simple terms, your argument is that the descriptor or the defect, defect in the descriptor of the plaintiff entity does not affect standing. No, not at all. Did they, did they, did they, right? I, mean, uh, I would not, because it, it's, uh, 
I'm calling it a spirit of error. Let me, let me finish. Sure. And the other part, I think, of what you said, because there you said a lot, but I, in, for purposes of our review, this is a 1.540 curable problem. At least that's sufficient. You, you took in the briefs, and I think you're saying that here, that it's a scrivener's error that could be cured, and we don't know what's going to go on with the other 10,000 judgments that have the wrong entity named. But what have I missed? Well, it's akin to it. I'm not saying necessarily a scrivener's error per se, because I mean, the, the, as uh, uh, the opponents pointed out, um, uh, you know, there have been interrogatories, you know, is this an error? Do you mean, um, I'm phrasing here, I said, no, we mean the Bank of New York Mill. So it's akin to Strickland's error. And if it is a problematic thing, it's something that should But in a divorce proceeding, if one of the parties' last name gets left off and there's a judgment of divorce that's rendered, they remain married. Mm. Um. <laughs> They do. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's, you know, it's, okay. if, if, the court, if the court wants to go down that road, I, 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 I would have to make policy arguments here that I'm not well, comfortable making. Nobody's given us a reason not to reverse it on that basis. No one, I mean, there's been no one to show, A, it's the correct name, or B, there's been a registration that allows the Well, name. the reason is because it's, that you have to go by the name that's on the allonge. The name that's on the lines is the Bank of New York Mellon. Are you, I mean, if you're saying, oh, we really come up and say that there's a four. Well, sounds like the lines are wrong then, too. And you're going to you kick I it mean, back to me. If you me. write me a check and you give it a different last name, ah, that check is no good. That check is going to be in the name of whoever you wrote it to. Why is this any different? I mean, banks would not honor that check. Why should we honor what the bank does with the wrong name? If you leave off the, you know, if I paid my homeowners association and left off the, the INC, I don't think the bank is going to kick that back and say, no, we're not, we're not going to cash you that. The bank may not kick it back, but the bank's not a court of law. Yeah, yeah. I know. I don't describe it. But again, the banks are really loose about details. What, what does he do? You have this, the, the, the servicer has a note here. It says payable to... The, uh, the Bank of New York Mellon, formerly known as the Bank of New York. No corporate. What is the service you say? Well, you got, we got to get another allonge here. And who is the allonge from in that, in that scenario? I mean, if there is no entity, I mean, you have all of us, you have to go back to J.P. Morgan. Listen, you screwed up on the, pardon me, you, you messed up on the, uh, uh, on this, uh, on this allonge here. You have to do another allonge. I mean, that gets, gets kind of messy. And again, and to, to reverse this, well, you're on, I mean, I, I don't know what I mean, to tell you. I don't want the banks to get messy for heaven's sake. Well, yeah, and this is a, in this case, this loan has been in default since October 1st, 2007. I know that. Well, that's, that, that's, that's the way it, that's the cookie crumbles. But it's not relevant. <laughs> it's not relevant. But it is to an extent because then all of a sudden we go back for a third time. Sure, and then right. we got it right the first time. I mean, the bank, again, we have all those hundreds of cases out there. All the judgment, you know, if, you know, are they all void? Is the court going to really write an opinion? This is void, and all, you, you, I don't. That's not really a problem. <laughs> what about your argument that the, the bank isn't the real party in interest, the the trustee is? Well, that's true. That's that is another. Uh, it, it, the trust and under one point two one zero, I believe. Uh, uh, yeah, um, the, the trust. Is the real party interested? The trust has been is, is existed since 2006. It's the part. It's a group of investors here, and they have a trustee, the bank, acting on the rest. So the fact that we're not talking about, I mean, this is not the bank that's collecting the money. This is not you know the, the original lender here. This is a trustee or a group of investors who have purchased this uh, loan from uh, Novastar. Um, so that's the real. That's you know. We, or just the bank itself suing in its, in its own individual capacity. I mean, who it is, because only, you know, trust, and trust, and trust, and trust, and trust, Then I, I would say, yeah, that's a, that's a serious problem. But we do have the real party and interest behind it, which is that you're going to fault the trustee for not labeling itself when it's not the real party and interest. I, I, I would submit that that's, that would be a, a mistake. Um, Okay, yeah, we've talked about the PCI. Yeah, there's nothing, I believe there's, uh, there are some, you raised five points in appeal. What are the other ones? Um, I don't know if you, the court is interested in discussing them. Mr. Bruzzo didn't. Um, so having said that, unless the court has any other questions, I'd be would rest on, on brief and uh, otherwise. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
Addressing the point that Your Honor brought up, absolutely, without question, the trustee is the real party in interest. The trust is not an entity, except in rare circumstances, it cannot be sued, it can't bring a lawsuit, it has to be the trustee. Why? Because the trustee has legal title. Now here we have a defectively named trustee, and I want him to mention in passing, I understand that there is a legion of law saying that, that not being a party to the pooling and servicing agreement, the PSA, or to the assignments of mortgage and those things, that I can't, people in my position, can't um, question them. And I say, why not? I have standing. I'm injured by them. I have causation in fact. There's a, I have all the elements that standing requires in other matters, but I'll leave that for... Uh, the attorney, Bank of New York Mellon has, I have to assume, some of the highest paid attorneys in the country, if not the world. And yes, why don't they, rhetorically I ask, name the entity correctly. He says, oh, I don't cite any uh, authority because you're supposed to know the name of your client when you're bringing a suit. The, the, the note that was endorsed was stamped asset back bank, excuse me, um, and not asset bank, and that was carried over. That makes it defective. The authority for the servicer to bring lawsuit, they say in their answers to interrogatories that it's because of the, the limited powers of attorney Mr. Wyman says, oh, that's just to show the nexus or how, whatever word he used. No, it's required by statute. It's uh, 702.015. Um, I want to point out to the court that the PSA does not list the loans. Does it show that my loan is part of that uh, covered under the pooling and servicing agreement? And going back to Judge Morris's comment, if an entity or a, something that's trying to be an entity doesn't exist, it doesn't have standing, it can't have standing. So it needs the corporate identifier. They've recognized that. They file all their, their SEC documents with the correct name. And... 30 seconds. And in my 30 seconds, I will just say again, thank you, and wish you all a good year. It's still January, I think I'm allowed to thank say you. that. So I hope to be here for all. Thank you much. Thank you both. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. All rise. Invited. Thank you. <laughs> we don't get invited to coffee with the judges? What happened to that? They used to have us. Uh, Travel safely. Did they really? Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to think where was it was. Um, it kind of looked like a small guy. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I need. Yeah. I, I, I'm. I'm.